The Legend of Korra Turf Wars. It starts with me finally seeing Avatar Korra and Asami go to the spirit world. Korra talks as if you never know when the ground might drop out from underneath you here just because it surprised her a lot. But I don't remember that in particular ever happening here. I guess it makes sense that she'd be pretty paranoid of a place that temporarily turned her into a child. And the reason she even took the risk of going here then was her confidence as the Avatar. They ride on a flying bird dragon and look at giant versions of weeds. We see them stand on giant mushrooms, which is only interesting on its own because it happens a lot elsewhere. Then they finally did something a vacationer would do again by going swimming. Korra challenges her to a race to see who climbs to the top of a mountain first. It's charming to see her tease Korra that she's being slow, because I know she's usually nice to her and just playing around. It also tries to be amusing because Korra lies that she's going easy on her. Then there's a rumble, so maybe things will finally get exciting. While all the story before this was visually interesting, it still had me impatient from boredom. It turns out the mountain was a giant rock spirit. He throws them wanting to leave, and Cory earbands to slow down their fall. She hopes Asami's okay and apologizes, feeling responsible for this. Asami stays calm because they've been through worse and reassures her. She says they lost all their supplies, and the last thing she wants to do on their vacation is kiss her. I'm both happy for them and very confused because the show never made it clear that they developed feelings for each other and never showed them admit it thanks to not being allowed to. Even them holding hands as the final shot came out of nowhere. But I thought it was just because they were preparing to head into a dangerous world and had to be a good team to get through it. If it weren't for the people responsible for the show confirming their relationship upgrade and that spreading on the internet, I never would have known before reading this comic that they got a crush on each other. And I can understand someone being confused as an off-put by this being in the series, only if it's because this is set in the Big Band era, where you'd expect the two to be too afraid to tell each other how they feel in the first place. So they're lucky this even happened. Instead of the writer lazily keeping their confession off-screen and making their relationship upgrade jarring when they're nothing but friends before, the story should have shown me them telling each other how they feel. Maybe then their vacation to the spirit world wouldn't have been completely forgotten by me to the point where I was surprised at getting to see it when I reread this. I know there's a page of Shipti's examples between them in the last season of the show, but I only saw those as friend moments. It's not a shipping moment unless there's kissing or blushing. I could have only taken this seriously if this was a later time period, but instead the series rushed it. I know these couples exist in every time period, but that doesn't distract me from how lucky these two had to get. It's like if the writer made his desperate for money main characters win the lottery. Where we know it's still possible, so it's not literally a dance ex machina, but it's still a problem if it feels like it. I don't think anyone complained about Bolin getting a girlfriend in the form of a new character really late in the show. So the fans would have been fine with it if Korra and Asami had the same treatment. They get along well, so they do make great partners. Better than Korra and Mako, who are arguing constantly. Korra reminds Asami of when she took her race car driving when they first met, and says that she was relieved to find out that she could be just as intense and wild as someone who was told she was too much of that her whole life. She's never had anyone in her life who got her the way she did. This does some extra work in justifying why they became so close. Even without the slime, they still got along. I just never got the sense in the show that they are literally kindred spirits. Asami says that in the three years they were apart because Korra was recovering from being poisoned, she realized how much Korra meant to her and almost told her that in her letters, but was too scared to in case she'd never come back, because she already seemed untrustworthy by being away from her for so long. So now I have to assume that Korra was the one who told her about how she felt and caused her to confess. Asami asks Korra when she knew how she felt about Asami. Korra says that after she was poisoned, she was there for it. Why wouldn't this apply to the rest of her friends too? And it's a stretch that Asami was the only one she wrote to when she was gone, as if the rest of her friends suddenly meant nothing to her. She doesn't even have to open up to them just because she's writing to them. She puts her hand on Korra's shoulder and saying she's glad she wrote to her. I wish her friendship with her was memorable in the show so that I could buy it better. Even after seeing the show twice, 
I can't remember any standout moment where they really enjoyed their friendship. Their ride shows up, and Asami fortunately wonders how it keeps knowing where to find them. Korra says it can sense where she was. It would have made more sense right away if she said it could recognize her scent instead. Korra helps her climb up on it, and she says their vacation doesn't have to end, and tells the Draken bird something in a whisper which keeps it pacing fast. The ride heads for some portals. I always liked that they were shaped like lines of light instead of the stereotypical circular portals. Korra got the harebrained idea to visit her parents with Asami and tell them about them because she naively assumes they'll be happy for them in the Big Band era. But the similarity to the real world American Big Band era in Korra's Republic City is still too much to have you believe this will go well. The Korra show doesn't feel as much like a separate world from ours because Republic City feels more like America than Asia. Korra hugs her dad, who reminds me of a Kaura in appearance, and there's some more boring, predictable dialogue. Korra's mom puts her hand on her shoulder and invites the two to dinner because they must be starving. Korra says it smells good and gets thanked and called sweetie. Korra just says their vacation was fun and there's an awkward silence. So for once it's understandable that the pacing is slow. Korra somehow didn't think she'd be this nervous. They hold hands, and Asami calls her incredible and has some more likable dialogue. After a surprised reaction, Korra's parents are happy for them, with Korra's mom saying it's wonderful because they're supposed to be likable characters. It could have gone either way, and I'm relieved that the writers spared us the easy drama that would have been more believable. There's other sorts of conflict you can have in a story that actually do have a chance of being enjoyable to read. It still seems rushed that's so easy, instead of telling a story about this. Korra hugs her mother who says she's happy for her, and she thanks her. Korra's dad thoughtfully warns her to be careful because it's best to keep her personal life private. Her mom's smart enough to warn her that not everyone will be accepting. Korra recklessly plans to tell anyone she wants without caring, completely ignoring Asami's nervousness about this earlier. She generally assumes they're narrow-minded even though they're clearly the opposite, and Asami wisely says they should go, and thankfully she says good idea and they leave as Korra's dad says he didn't mean to upset them. Asami admits she understands the reaction and says she's not embarrassed and would totally be right behind her. I doubt that. She says she wanted her older self for longer. It's cathartic to see Korra immediately admit that she was being an idiot who steamrolled over her feelings and apologize. It's satisfying to see her immediately confront Korra on this instead of pushing the drama to the side for action for a while. And she immediately forgives Korra. Lucky her. But they are pretty good friends. And they go into the portal together holding hands. I was just so used to relationships and characters that people want together being abused by the writing for tedious relationship drama from stuff like Archie, Sonic, iCarly, and Friends. So it's impressing me that I don't see that. I feel like the very concept of relationship drama makes a relationship not really worth showing in a story when other forms of drama are always better in entertainment, not making you impatient for it to be over instantly. In a public city at the new portal, a stuffy old man expects Aang's daughter Janora and her new airbender friends to leave this place or he'll call the cops because this is his property. Janora thinks they have the right to be here just because the land belongs to some spirits. He's the one who's right but it's trying to make us hate him with its attitude problem. This place used to be in the spirit world, so I can understand Janor saying that it should legally belong to the spirits because their property replaced his, as long as the spirits actually have a legal ownership from having an actual government, which I never saw a hint of before. They always seem to be like sentient animals who just wandered the wild or lived in caves. Janor says she was just meditating near the portal. I'll always prefer her original outfit. The old man introduces himself as Wan Yong, who tries to comfort Asami on her father's sacrifice. Jinora says he's trying to build a road to drive tons of tourists into the spirit world. Korra and Asami know firsthand what a fun and pleasant place the spirit world is, so I feel like it'd be selfish of them to think no one but them should get to enjoy themselves there. The real problem is that only people with airbending or earthbending would be able to survive a fall from being thrown by a giant there. So they should be explaining that the spirit world is dangerous for that reason. But somehow these two don't explain that, so he has no chance of understanding their point of view. How does he not know that sometimes spirits can be dangerous? He should explain that only benders will be allowed to visit the spirit world. 
Without that rule, I'd be opening himself up to getting sued for irresponsibly causing people to get killed by spirits. The spirit arbitrarily calls this place sacred. I think the spirits are just calling all their property sacred out of arrogance just because it's their property. The spirit wants the portal closed because he doesn't want humans exploiting it. It sounds selfish when he just says that. The spirit thinks he has to protect his kind when obviously the humans are the ones that need protection from them. Why are invincible gods afraid of humans instead of casually ignoring them? They shouldn't even care if they were to build buildings in the spirit world. Korra says she thinks the energy of the portal will have a harmonious effect on the city's people. Since when does portal energy brainwash people into being calmer? The spirit holds her responsible for keeping the portal safe. Asami puts her hand on her shoulder reaffirming her loyalty, and the new Air Nation plans on helping too. Eventually, Cory goes into the Avatar state and scares Wanyong and his people away. I don't understand why he wants to build a road, because people will be able to get to the portal and enter it without one. Isn't there a road nearby anyways? The spirit world will be so interesting that people would visit it regardless of whether they had to walk for a while to get there. And he should know that. Then the story gets boring with some street gangs having a bending fight. Which is boring because it happened a lot in the show already. Why am I seeing this? Where are the main characters? It turns out one of the street gangs has a new leader. It's interesting that he fights with canes and is an acrobat. But it just seems to be him getting lucky by dodging all of the rocks. I get to see the impact when he hits one of the people who is insisting on trying to take his gang's territory on him for no apparent reason. I get why we aren't told the reason because we're not supposed to sympathize with street gangs. But it's so lazy writing to not clarify a motive. It's not like these people benefit from having more territory so that they could have more places to sell drugs. Or even anything other than that that the comic would be allowed to reference. Eventually it's revealed that the new leader Takoga is a chi blonker. A flying vehicle above them has metal bending cops come out of it who started arresting using their metal bending. And Mako and Bolin are part of the cops, with Mako still on the job despite being injured. In a world with waterbending healing, why is he still hurt from the end of the show? I have to assume there aren't any waterbenders nearby. And that Korra sucks at healing. And that he can't afford to go to a hospital to get healed by one. Another criminal gets arrested effortlessly. It's charming that he asks Bolin how he's been and Bolin tells him about it because of their past friendship. And the criminal says he's impressed by these two. I guess he liked them so much he's just happy they got jobs at all. So that's why he doesn't simply hate them for becoming cops. It's so convenient. I don't know why someone able to form such a bond became a criminal. Bolin thanks him. And eventually, Mako whispers to his boss what his plan is to trick information on the new villain out of him. So Toph's daughter with a forgettable name presumably lies to him, causing him to say that the attack on the gang was Takoga's plan, not his. When a part of the spirit world merged with the human world in the city, it replaced the triad's turf. So Takoga killed their old leader in the chaos. Then at the temporary evacuee camp, it's explained how the evacuees who lost everything are being helped by people. If a waterbender is right there in the city, why is Mako still injured? I guess she sucks at healing. In one of the comic stories, Katari healed Sokka's broken arm in the span of one story. And Mako having a broken arm isn't even required for the plot. I guess Mako didn't know where to find Aang's daughter. Or where the medic tent even was. Everyone starts happily greeting Korra, and Aang's son Tenzin sweetly smiles at this and hugs her, hoping she and Asami are both feeling refreshed from their vacation. Korra thanks him as Kiyo welcomes Asami home, showing her affection. It's good writing that we get to see the realistic consequence of the destruction of people's homes downtown. Once some of the people there have been telfragged by the sudden appearance of the spirit world place, I'm glad it's not talking about that. Tenzin starts giving out boring exposition, and so far I don't know if I need to know it yet. So I'm bored. He complains that the president somehow did nothing to help this problem because he's so concerned about re-election. He somehow doesn't realize that helping might get him re-elected. It's satisfying to learn that he's unpopular because he surrendered to Kavir the Tyrant. Korra pets a lemur, and thankfully Kia says some of the evacuees are just grateful for Korra saving the city. 
Kenzie says she had a great idea, as I'm still desperate for stuff to happen again. Cora wants Sami to go with her, and I get why she'd rather stay here. She makes an excuse that she'd rather learn how to actually help. And people want to see the Avatar, not her. Thankfully, Cora humors her without a big drama and leaves wanting to lift people's spirits. She feels sorry for people here, of course. But it's especially important to point out when she's being sympathetic because some fans just want to see her as unsympathetic. Because she's not like Aang. It's a way to see the civilians thank her and say she's the best. She asks if there's anything she can do to help and gets overwhelmed by people smartly asking for help. If only she had a piece of paper and a clipboard to write this all down, it wouldn't be a problem how many favors were requested. She is the Avatar, it's her job to help out. Tenzin cares more about her than the people here, so he plans to get her out of here. Thankfully, Korra wants to stay. Earth bends to make a platform and makes a long, boring speech to tell them to see this as a new beginning. If you can Earth bands make a platform, why aren't there a bunch of houses here made from Earth bending? I assume that there isn't enough land here for all of them to have little houses, but still, none of them having them is stupid. She reassures them predictably. I wish she didn't talk so much. I'd rather see things happen than a bunch of dialogue. Tenzin sweetly smiles at her raising morale for people, and eventually Cory gets told that Sami started drawing plans for new houses. I guess by real homes, those people meant homes with running water and electricity, and Cora knew that. Because homes like that actually would require money from the city to make. Then the story seems to waste my time with a focus on the president and focus on re-election. We were already told about him. Tenzin's complaints shouldn't have been there then. I like that Reiko actually objects to a misleading campaign poster. It doesn't mean much for its morality though because he immediately agrees to it. I like seeing Cora tease him on it. He sold the problem and he says he doesn't have the money to help because he somehow thought he needed more cops instead. I didn't think they were understaffed. But this isn't a forced situation because even without that, he could have still spent all of his money on fixing infrastructure, which he mentions. And thankfully the campaign manager tells Raikou that helping them would be a good idea. He shouldn't be written to say he has an impossible approval rating. I wish the pacing was faster because Raiko figured this obvious fact out on his own. He shouldn't need this guy to do all the thinking for him, and he did all the thinking for himself as far as I saw in the show. So this is out of character. He humors the heroes, gets thanked for it, and Korra warns him about Wanyong's plan and presents him a good idea to make the land a nature reserve. Which he should have remembered getting told that the city's broke. She should have said, you could buy the property after you have the money. Asami reassures her as they leave, and appreciates the sunset. This is trying to be heartwarming, but I'm just writing another scene full of talking with nothing happening to look interesting and exciting. Because the plot of the arc overall has barely progressed, so most of the time I'm just really bored talking about this. Kia reassures them that they make a good couple. She figured them out because out of nowhere, they reminded her of how happy she was from the first vacation she had with her first girlfriend. It still doesn't make sense. They're friends. So why would seeing them be happy together cause her to jump to this conclusion when they were happy together before? Being slightly happier with someone doesn't mean you're in love with them. She just believed this because she really wanted it to be true so she could have someone to relate to. I guess that makes sense enough to justify this. I'm just saying that when you do something controversial, you should have it be written better instead of having constant, overly convenient writing carrying it along the whole time. Because that's not going to cause more acceptance right away. Anyways, Kia also reveals out of nowhere that her friends and family all know that she's had girlfriends. Cora says her parents were worried about what people would say about this. Kia says that's normal for the Water Tribe because they prefer for people to keep family matters private. Kia says her father was just supportive of her. Which is another convenience I wouldn't expect because Aang's a relic from a century ago who kept struggling with progress. And if she was an airbender, he wouldn't have been as supportive. But conveniently, it turns out that in the Air Nation, nobody hid who they loved. But didn't Aang grow up almost entirely around other kids? When would he have ever seen adults other than Monkey Atso? Apparently he did all the time after all. This is justified because it's another world from ours. So it doesn't have to be like ours to make sense. But it still takes getting used to because it's unexpectedly pleasant. 
Speaking of that, even the Fire Nation was tolerant of more unique couples for most of its history. It sure is another universe, alright. That's easy to forget, though, because immediately, it reveals that Sozin outlawed this kind of relationship just so the writer could give him an unnecessary kick the dog moment. At least that's believable. The story says Kiyoshi liked both, just like Asami and Korra do. It sure is convenient that they met while also both being that way. But coincidences do happen. I don't like the way she's drawn here, though. The Earth Kingdom has always been the slowest to accept change and the most repressive with their military. You mean the Fire Nation was, right? They can make their own element appear whenever they want, so they're always the most dangerous army. This discussion wants to make it more believable that they got together with the excuse that's another planet. But it fails because all it does is say that it is looked down on in most of the world, including the land they're standing on. The Republic City most recently belonged to the Fire Nation. Anyways, Korra doubts she and Asami would find acceptance, which is better writing than her always stubbornly staying with one opinion and idea of behaving. I just prefer seeing characters be written realistically. Asami says she feels like people are more accepting in the city now. What does she think that? I guess she conveniently saw a bunch of alternative couples in the evacuee camp without them being treated rudely. But she should say that. Because I don't take it seriously that she just says she has a feeling, not knowing it for a fact. He says they'll know when the time is right to share the news. And eventually says that anytime they need to talk, she's here. Korra thanks her and so does Asami, and Bolin shows Korra affection as Mako hugs Asami. And Korra congratulates Bolin on his first arrest. The girls are asked how their vacation went. And because they're somehow too awkward to talk about it, even though most of it was normal friend interaction, they plan to tell them the truth to stop hiding things from their friend. Korra's interrupted by the astral projection of Genora saying that street gangs are fighting the new airbenders. So the heroes take a ride on an air bison heading for the portal. Mako can't call the cops for backup because radio frequencies have been screwy since the portal appeared for no logical reason out of nowhere. Translation, the writers wanted more tension for longer and the heroes having a bunch of backup would destroy that. But the cops would take until the end of the fight to get there anyways, so that's no excuse. Korra glides over to the airbenders and the fight starts. I don't feel motivated to describe most of it. As usual, what exactly happens in the fight isn't the point. But it was interesting how he used a cane to throw someone over him. I can't wait for Toga to fail in some way, because if he always stays like this, he'll be nothing but a villain too. Eventually a smoke bomb gets thrown. So that's interesting too. And this lets Toga get away. Mako thanks him for the save as he helps him up and makes him smile by calling him partner. The spirits decide to protect the portal, so people get scared away, and Korra calls the spirit out. Eventually Korra saves Asami and sends a rock at a bat gun. I don't know why Asami is all dazed. She just got sprayed with water. Eventually, a spirit runs to Koga and merges with him self-destructively, because he's fine with ruining his own life. Or killing himself. It's dramatic and makes it more interesting, so it makes more sense meta-wise than in universe. The spirits leave. Asami waking up makes Koro leave enough to kiss her in front of her friends, who only react with surprise for a few panels before conveniently being happy because we're supposed to like them. What a nice alien world version of the 1920s. It also helps that they're friends, so of course they'll be polite to them but it still doesn't feel like how it'd realistically go. Mako's the only one that reacts realistically, and I just have to assume it's because he used to date them both. Bolin's smart enough to ask why the street gang was here because he thought they weren't after the spirit portal. I like that even Bolin gets a smart moment. Gore figures that someone sent them to intimidate away the new Air Nation. Wang Yong predictably was the one who sent the criminals after them, and Dakoka comes after him for revenge. We're only assuming Korra sent the spirit to attack him, despite not being that far away when she talked to him. Plus she would have been talking louder than normal because she was upset. But apparently his hearing's not good. Takoka tells him he works for him now. I can't blame him for wanting to get back at him and get a reward for his life being ruined. 
his family wouldn't want to see him looking like this. Cora thanks Aang's family for accompanying her on the Air Bison trip, where she plans on wasting time reassuring the evil spirits. Somehow, Milo is the only one still sleepy this early. Iki looks forward to seeing pretty flowers, but only sees dead ones in the spirit world. I hope this thing makes sense, because this seems dumb. Milo's not pure good and just complains that he was woken up for nothing. He's kind of the most relatable one here. Tenzin puts his hand on Korra's shoulder and reassures her. She thanks him. Jinora says only the spirits have the power to kill those flowers. And Korra thinks they did it as a warning to keep humans out. It'd make a bit more sense if she said, The whole reason humans want to visit this place is because it's good looking. So it only makes sense to make it not good looking. Iki touches a dead plant for no reason, which means it can't take it very seriously when it magically grabs her and all the plants try to grab them despite being dead. So it must be that they're getting controlled with magic. They all rush out of the spirit world, see tanks from the United Forces, and General Iroh tells metal benders to set up a perimeter. After last night's battle, the President wants the portal on lockdown. And sadly, he doesn't immediately simply explain that he doesn't want citizens coming here because who knows what the spirits would do to them. Which would immediately make him sound reasonable. Court's against the troops being here because it'll only make the spirits more mad. And it's lampshaded that this isn't a necessary decision. The story gets boring as Mako's boss is shown unnecessarily recapping to us for too long, and it only gets more interesting when she can't read his handwriting. Bolin was just so excited they just felt like he had to tell her some private information, which she doesn't cause drama about. And Mako calls him out on this. She's filled in on Korra's hunch about who sent the criminals, and for no reason she thinks she's wrong. It's like her not believing that Beric did something wrong all over again. She says Wanyang is very hard to get to, so she demands some evidence first. It's reasonable. But who else could it be, really? Bolin thanks Ping the criminal for the flattery, and Mako interrogates him to try to track down Takoga. And because he says messages, Bolin assumes he's being given messages with kids because of his own past history in a gang. Mako praises him and gets thanked. And eventually, after the story is boring for too long with nothing to say about this unnecessary scene, someone tells the Avatar she'll have to make an appointment with the President to talk to him because he's busy when he's clearly not. And I like that she makes him shut up. She expects her arguments against his idea to be listened to despite it sucking. She should have said he might be looking at another spirit crisis in the first place. Korra says she made the portal by accident and had no choice because Kuvira's weapon was out of control. Somehow, Raiko successfully turns people against Korra despite what she said making it obvious that her actions saved the entire city. I'm just thinking, are we really doing this? The rest of the story was so much more mature than this, and this is just straight out of a stupid kid's story. He does have a point that she was vacationing instead of helping the people she made homeless. I don't take her seriously when she says it wasn't like that, because how else could it be like? Asami and Tenzin stand up to him. What was the point of the scene? I thought it was to make Raiko look good for showing us what the new housing would look like. I don't see how this is necessary. Asami says someone should put Raiko in his place, and Tenzin says the person more capable than him of leading the country is Varric's secretary because she was able to keep up with all of his silly demands. She's reluctant and thanks them. Eventually, Asami comforts Korra when she's angsty, and the story's pacing slows down again. The narration's boring, too. At least it's justified in-universe because Bolin's doing that, and he gets told to shut up. The story starts wasting my time again, until so finally Mecco notices one of the kids that deliver messages for gang members, who runs away. And eventually, Mako grabs him easily. After a while of them being annoying but realistically evasive, Mako relates him and says people could die if they don't find the guy he's working for. So they're given the info. And eventually, Asami gets approached by someone condescending who somehow doesn't want her to complete the construction project for homeless evacuees. She's a gang leader who somehow thinks Asami would agree to work for her. She says her gang would offer her protection for a monthly fee. 
Asami says she already told her, so I assume she's gonna get hurt in the next panel. I'm glad she gets a chance to equip her electrical blood instead. Luckily, the leader decides to leave and come back in a few days on the off chance she'll have changed her mind by then. I say luckily because she's outnumbered. The smart thing to do is obviously to humor them. Why does the place she's in have no security? Anybody can just walk in here. Why does the story expect me to be interested in a bunch of criminals I never saw before talking? Their dialogue is boring. Finally, Takoko shows up again. He breaks that he's stronger and quicker now, and plans to take control of an entire city. I guess just to take advantage of him being the most scary looking gang leader ever now. It still seems silly because that's a lot of tedious work they might not like having to do. Ugh, I really don't care about what these villains have to say. I know the heroes are gonna win, and even if they lose the current fight, they'll win in the end. And everything they're saying can probably be skipped just fine because it'll come up again when stuff happens. It turns out that Mako accidentally led Bullet and his boss to a room full of mannequins with a bomb. Thankfully, he's forgiven right away because it's not his fault Takogo was one step ahead of them. I guess the kid was told to tell them to go here. Mako wants to talk to Wanyo, so he goes to his office and is expected to leave. He's been missing for days and his employees didn't call the police because he's such a private man. I see the pacing's as bad as ever. Eventually, it turns out Korra has to talk to a big guy first before visiting Asami because she was smart enough to hire a security guard. That's a little effort. But obviously, one guy would still be outnumbered by a gang anyways. Asami tells Korra what happened to her and tells her she'll handle it herself. Because she doesn't want to feel like she has to help her. They hug and eventually some people complain about being hungry. And Varric kept some food for himself because he's smart. Varric reassures her and then expects a massage. And it's satisfying when she intimidates him into doing that instead. Considering what a bad boss he was before. She asks him about the idea of her running for president. Do we need to see a scene like this? Well, it was worth getting to see him compliment her. And it gets more character development because she's worried that she wouldn't be able to handle losing the election or having to run a country. Cora gets stood up at a restaurant. At least I get to see someone talk in a respectful way to her. She has the common sense to assume Asami's in trouble and call Mako telling him and Bolin to meet up with her. Eventually, Korra sees Asami's office in a mess. Again, the story dwells on something more than necessary. That's what the word eventually means in these reviews. The story shows us the hideout of the Crystal Gang, and Korra barges into it and eventually gets told to look for Asami by the leader. Aang's family does some predictable, long-winded bitching. Mila says they should get all of the airbenders together and march on the portal. Tenzin says a peaceful protest with them all could rally the city's people behind them and pressure Raikou to withdraw the troops, even though the troops are there to protect the city from spirits they're rightfully paranoid of. The Air Nation isn't guarding the place 24-7. Predictably, Korra didn't find Asami. Why did she get kidnapped when she has an electrified knockout glove? I'm asking this because all this exposition is boring. It makes sense that they didn't show her getting kidnapped, because how is the writer supposed to actually make it look justified when she has a glove like that? Korra gets told what Mako learned recently, and he gets radioed in his cop car that the police department's being threatened by the very same gang they're after next. Korra gets to tell Takoga that she was trying to stop that spirit, and surprisingly, he believes her. If only the pacing was faster. Eventually, he reveals to them that Wanyo is being held hostage in a blimp above them. Eventually, Korra starts using her bending against the bad guys and gets grabbed by Takoga's spirit arm. Korra is told to let Toga and his gang leave, and Asami gets threatened in front of her. Eventually. The leader of the Creeping Crystal Triad gets humanized because she's playing pool for fun. The name for gang's too long though, so I don't like saying it. Eventually, her rival gang intimidates her with fire and plans on taking over her territory. General Iroh sees the air bison's approaching and is level-headed like I expect. He tells Tenzin that he wants to see a peaceful resolution too. Miss Beifong explains that they can't do anything because Takoga threatens to turn the neighborhood into rubble if they make a move. Eventually, Korra gets comforted for a few panels and she thanks her. 
eventually get to see a zombie call out Wanyong because his greed got her in the situation. He just justifies himself predictably, and she states the obvious reminding him of a past situation. And she tells him off that her father is better than him, which makes him ashamed. Togoga still blames Kor for what happened to him, even though clearly he got himself in that situation. He kidnapped Asami for a more interesting reason than the reason we thought. He knows she's good at machinery, and he wants her to make him something according to one of her father's blueprints, which he found because it was given to Wanyang by her father. He says that when he realized her father wanted to make him weapons, he walked out on a deal with him. I like knowing why he walked out on a deal with him after all. Wait, if he didn't like the blueprints, why didn't he destroy them? Now I have to assume that he was saving them for a rainy day. In case he was extremely desperate for money, he wanted them developed. Because otherwise, he could have stopped the whole plot. Because otherwise, this and Korra sucking at explaining herself to Wanyang are pretty good reasons for why the whole plot is lucky it even happened. She sees a blueprint of a gas dispersion pump, and his plans to threaten the city with poison gas from an airship. Asami wastes time refusing to help him when obviously it's do or die, and he threatens someone in front of her, causing her to humor him. The president finds out about Zuli's campaign and is smart enough to assume she'll win right away. He calls her a hero for helping Korra take down the mecha giant of Kavira's invasion. His campaign manager is smart because he says he could make her look bad to people by calling her reckless because of that. The president told about the protest and says it's an opportunity to change the narrative. After a needlessly long time, Mako does explain that he's been getting Kia to heal him. It needs to be explained that she's bad at healing. Even then, wouldn't that just hurt him? How is healing nerfed? Korra feels bad for him and says that if she stopped the spirit from attacking Takoga instead of saving Asami, none of this would be happening. Spirits are invincible, how could she stop the spirit? I guess she means energy bend the spirit to make it feel better? Asami probably shouldn't have been in the fight when she's a non-bender. Mako relates to her that he's been in her position before in the show. He has a plan to search for Asami without tipping off their enemies, but he'll explain later because Bayphone can't know about it for some reason. She hugs him, and predictably explains that the only reason he's been acting awkward is because one of his exes dating another one of his exes is hard to get used to, and he acknowledges that she and Asami are perfect for each other. Personality-wise, there really is no hard evidence against that. I mean, Korra does get mad at her sometimes, but she gets mad at everyone sometimes. Because she wants people to humor her and be on her side. And none of her arguments with her result in drama that lasts too long. Milo lampshades that protesting is boring, and Tenzin puts his hands on his shoulders. Eventually, Raiko says to send in the waterbenders. And thankfully, General Lyra wishes he was allowed to call them off. Why does he even care what the airbenders are doing? I guess he thinks the people will side with them? All he has to do is tell Raiko that the airbenders aren't fighting back and there's no cause for this and immediately he changed his mind. Why is he so indecisive when he was extremely stubborn about refusing to lead his army against Unalak? Amon and him have the same personality of being lying jerks with better reputations than they deserve. And they both have weird names that don't tell me anything about them without research. So it made just as much sense for me for one of them to have the name Unalak as the other. And it's been years since I watched the show. I guess the reason he changed his mind is because he doesn't want even worse PR than having them here would have. A part of the wall falls over and Zuli tells everyone behind her to follow her, bringing a camera crew. Tenzin thanks her for convincing all those people to join her. She says in front of a camera that the portal is a symbol of harmony and should be shared by everyone, not held hostage. So she gets people to start chanting against him. She has a good reputation, so it makes sense that it's easy. Mako explains to his friends why he knows where the creeping crystals are. The leader of the gang gets talked to by Mako as she makes a crystal float above her hand. Because Earthbenders can't just control dirt and rocks. They control jewels too. Which makes their inability to control pure metal less believable because it's from the Earth too. So if jewels are part of the Earth element despite not being dirt, it makes you wonder why that doesn't apply to metal, too, because it's just as associated with Earth. Korra wants to know how to move around her old turf undetected, and Mako offers her a chance to get her turf back as a reward. 
And she says her gang got their name from the original creeping crystal that traps people in it. So there's more than one type of it? I like that they're heading for the abandoned earthen fire factory. Asami says she's almost finished. Cory goes into the room to start fighting. And Asami gets taken aboard the airship. The creeping crystal gets immediately smashed by Takoga because he's so strong. So all that build up about it was for nothing. He grabs a part of the flying airship. And Jurgula tells Korra unnecessarily that Takoga left taking Asami with him. And Korra tells her to go with her. But she refuses despite being outnumbered. Well, she wouldn't be a gang leader if she was careful. Why'd Korra get told to ride a motorcycle if she can use an air scooter that goes faster than it? Korra's a hunch about where they need to go because she assumes Takoga's going back to where this all started. Asami whispers to Wanyoung that if Takoga releases the poison gas, only the people in the airship are going to be killed. It's almost like it was a stupid idea for him to trust someone to engineer something for him that she didn't want. It's wild that she's got more guts than Eggman. Eggman didn't make sabotage armor for Sigma and the Zeti in Worlds Unite. Even though Asami had people watching when she made this thing too. Of course they didn't suspect a thing because they didn't know how she was supposed to do it. But Asami's used to being a hero. She's used to constantly facing dangerous situations. Conveniently, it turns out there's gas masks in the airship. I like that she gets to be proactive instead of just relying on Korra to save her. She whispers that she'll need Wanyong to get her and have gas masks when the time is right. Takoka takes a long time making a speech from his airship to make an impression. I like that Raiko is just annoyed. He wants Raiko to withdraw the United Forces from the city, or he'll use poison gas. He also explains who he's got as hostages. Asami grabs some wires and makes a click, and Raiko says that he backed down against Kuvira and isn't going to make the same mistake again. He orders the troops withdrawn for now, and then he wants the airship taken down despite the hostages in it. Which would have only been a good plan on the off chance Korra's plan failed because it'd save a whole bunch of people. It sounds harsh, but it's good that he had a backup plan for it. Zoo leaves one of the people helping evacuate people. And Korra asks Tenjin if everything's alright. General Ira warns Korra about Raiko's plan and how many minutes she's got. Korra asks when Tenzin ever knew her to be careful, which is charming at a time like this. And she rides an air bison. Atami releases the gas in the airship and dodges the punch and even flips him. Wanyong damages a window and the two heroes get their gas masks on. But Takoga's magically immune to poison gas even though only part of his body is spirit. And yet both parts of his body are unaffected. He takes off her mask and she immediately starts coughing even though she should have known not to inhale. Korra airbends away to Koga and uses more airbending to give Asami an air bubble to breathe. So that's interesting. Somehow Korra plans on landing the ship even though she's bad at driving and she's the bender. So Asami says she'll steer the airship while she protects her. She should have known that was a better plan. Takoga causes some damage that releases the gas. And Asami makes the assumption that every spirit is immune to it, even though they always show a huge variety of species differences from each other instead of all being the same species. There's no reason most of them would be immune. And any that are, is just a convenient coincidence. But she doesn't have a better option than to drive to the spirit world anyways. So if she didn't really believe this, it would make just as much sense. Considering that firebending is her default skill, I wonder why Korra's doing nothing but airbending even though firebending would let her create a wall of fire that she could get rid of in instant no harm no foul. So that'd be far more likely to hit her target than little bursts of wind. Really nothing in this arc has shown off what a badass Korra actually is compared to other benders that can fight. Korra eventually gets chi blocked, and he almost falls out of the window. So it must have been her steering that caused him to fall towards the window when it was going to kill her. Wanyong finally makes himself useful and uses an axe to make Takoka fall. I spent the whole arc expecting him to make a heroic sacrifice, by the way. Mako tells Bolin to help the girls while he does something stupid. A little girl says she hurt her leg while some gas is catching up to her. It's not explained how in the world that happened, because there's nothing around her that could have actually hurt her leg. 
I guess someone bumped into her when running away. It could have just been that she had a sprained ankle and it made just as much sense though. And Zuli runs over to her in front of the Air Nation and brings her to safety. Someone thanks her and Varric hugs her. And I like that he hopes that was gone on film. Of course it was, and the camera also got footage of Raiko running away. Even though he could have trusted the airbenders to protect him. The airbenders keep the poison from being a threat. Although I have to wonder why they didn't do that before she got the chance to save a kid from it. Why did they wait so long doing nothing? The airship lands with the girls flying into Koga's thugs in rough shape. Korra says she can heal them with spirit water. I guess spirit water because it's better at healing. Magically. And I guess that's being relied on because she's a bad healer. If she was a good healer, she would have healed Mako's arm long ago. Korra says something unusually sappy to quote Asami. The girls show each other affection. Wano gets unhandcuffed and the spirits show up. Eventually Korra wonders if this particular portal was never meant to exist. Which makes sense because of all the problems it caused. But Asami says it's too precious. The only reason she'd say it's precious is because it looks pretty. And she'd say that about every portal. It has to be because of the vines in the area making it look better. Wanyo gives up his claim on the land here. And the spirit asks him why because he's suspicious. So he says he owes these two women his life. The spirit humors them but says he'll be watching what happens next. He's got nothing better to do after all. Korra thanks Wanyo who well, I'm not going to say the last name of because the story never tells me how to pronounce it. And it's too easy to make fun of. And Sami shakes hands with him. Bolin puts his hand on Mako's shoulder, and Mako says there was no sign of Takoga. And somehow he survived with no injuries for no reason. Again, only some of his body is part spirit. So only some of it would be unharmed if that was the logic. Weeks later, a bunch of people are gathered at a hotel ballroom hoping to see Zhu Li get elected. There's a lot of time wasted here. Mako talks to Bolin unusually nicely, and he quits out of nowhere because he can't be tied down and likes to fly. If that means he doesn't want to keep the same job forever, that would be really bad for him because eventually who's going to hire him with him having a reputation of quitting every few weeks? He says it's about time he goes in separate ways from his brother. So maybe it just means that he doesn't want to work with them forever. Because he wants to prove he's more than just a little brother who needs protecting. Korra's dad asks how she and Asami are doing, and says he doesn't want the Water Tribe customs to dictate how he talks to his daughter. He hugs her, stating the obvious, and gets thanked. And predictably, Zuli wins and gets cheered for. Her. She gets to hug Beric again, who treats her a lot better as her husband, congratulating her and everything. Zuli thanks people and makes a boring, predictable speech. Eventually, she encourages people to say hi to strangers when passing by to encourage peace. Everything else she says is boring. It's too bad to see Raiko without finding out what job he's going to get after this. I still don't know. Zuli gives the ownership of the portal and surrounding area to the Air Nation. Eventually, she says the true mind can weather all the lies and illusions without being lost. So Surge is pretty weak then. Asami and Korra will hold hands, and Korra says she loves her and gets to hear it back as the story ends with Zuli's speech mentioning light when there's a portal of light in front of them. I just realized, shouldn't there be a ton of moths gathering around the portals? And why did the story end without Dakoga being killed off when he'll never be used again? He's not going to be able to do anything new if he does come back. This arc by Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitsko was mainly about a street gang that kidnapped Sasami wanted to take over the city with the gas-filled blimp because his leader became more ambitious from a spirit merging with him in a fight over territory thanks to his CEO. But none of that deep plot was memorable to me. So I forgot about all of it by the time I went back to it. While this was the first time in Avatar that a gang tried taking over a city, that's still not enough, because the Fire Nation already did that. So the only thing memorable about this arc is Kia's discussion with Asami and Korra about their out-of-nowhere relationship, and how people like them were treated historically. Which is just a pointless scene, because they never encountered backlash anyways, and it just tells you what you would have already assumed about the world. And their lack of backlash would have made sense if they didn't establish Sozin as a heteronormative crusader. 
to summarize, the story should have shown us the moment where they told each other how they felt to make the story of this feel natural so I could appreciate it. No other couple in fiction would get away with an off-screen love confession. The arc's intense and engaging story with a nice twist where a gang leader helps the heroes, but usually it's made boring by having nothing but boring dialogue that goes on too long. I prefer it over the promise because there's still necessary action scenes for a lot of it instead of almost nothing happening until the ending climax.